So good afternoon and welcome to today's RGU Knowledge Bytes for Business webinar, how digital solutions can power your net zero journey. My name is Neil Farman and I'm the Net Zero Business Development Manager here at Robert Gordon University. Before we get started with today's discussion, I just wanted to briefly draw your attention to our housekeeping slide to make sure that we all have an enjoyable session today. Key thing to note is that we we'll welcome your questions throughout the webinar and ask that you post them using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Once all the presentations are finished, we'll, whatever time's left, we'll use to answer any questions that have been asked by the audience. So over the past year, our Knowledge Bites for Business webinars have considered critical and future challenges across a number of industries. With COP26 fast approaching, our experts are now tackling some of the key barriers in the transition towards net zero with our runway to COP26 Knowledge Bites for Business mini-series. I'm delighted to say that this afternoon, we are joined by Nirmali, Carlos, Ike and Chamath from RGU's School of Computing, who will share their insights and experiences in developing digital and data solutions to address industry decarbonization challenges. So without any further ado, over to you, Nirmali. Thanks, Neil. So, okay, hello everybody. Good afternoon and welcome to our webinar. Uh, today. So my name is uh, Nirmali Viratunga, and together with my colleagues, Dr. Ike NKC Oji, Dr. Carlos Marina Garcia, and Chamath Paliavodana, uh, we will sh showcase through a couple of use cases how digital solutions can power uh, your net zero journey. So the role of digital solutions, as we know, is pervasive and with recent success in AI technologies, there is almost no application domain that we can find that perhaps cannot benefit from adopting these technologies. So in this webinar, what we want to do or what we plan to do is share with you some examples of how we have worked with industry to provide solutions, digital solutions, which in addition to providing economic benefit can also help or unleash the potential to help our net zero journey. So here what we have in, in our first use case is an application by uh, TAG Environment, Environmental Limited in, into circular economy planning for the de decommissioning of assets. Here we had the opportunity to apply at RGU, apply a AI to help with some of the decision points for TAG. So specif specifically, we were able to build a cloud-based solution for them, which will, which also will be demonstrated as part of this webinar. In the next use case, uh, what we plan to uh, present is how to automate corrosion detection to reduce environmental pollution. And then finally, we pre present a mobile application use case, which has helped the university actually to go paperless in their student attendance and uh, engagement management processes. Okay, so starting with our first use case, uh, which is the TAG's uh, prophecy system, uh, which was actually funded by what was then the Oil and Gas Innovation Center. It involved a collaboration with ourselves, RGU, and the AI reasoning uh, research group uh, with TAG, uh, who actually do environmental consultation, including the decommissioning of assets. So the aim here, is to try and encourage more repurposing or reusing of energy assets before they are considered for recycling or being classified as waste. In the prophecy project, therefore, what it does, it does is create a circular economy by trying to maximize the functional life of assets through reuse. So the main realization that Taj had was uh, that the decommissioning of an asset uh, had actually multiple reuse routes. For instance, um, let's say this, this asset here um, will probably have accommodation for their uh, offshore uh, workers. They would include communication and medical equipment, provision for food and water, um, IT equipment, entertainment uh, and gyms, for example, heat and power. And all of these we can see are also common to let's say a village. So unfortunately, unfortunately what Taj was telling us was that they found that when the asset gets decommissioned, 
all the potential materials and items here naturally get classified as waste or, or, or put to recycle. But instead, they could have been repurposed or even reused in this village setting. So then the idea was, could we link this up with an e-commerce market? If we can you know, um, uh, identify all the materials and items, perhaps we could link that up with an e-commerce market. That would then enable us to involve many users by matching the user's needs to available materials in the inventory. So this then allows us to repurpose or reuse materials and items and sort of extend their functional life. Uh, this fits very well with TAG's aim to encourage all users to make decisions uh, that are considerate of the environment, they are socially responsible, and in that process, of course, also to create some value. So, RGU, they, they are TAG approach at RGU with the task uh, of how to create prophecy, which, which is essentially involving the creation of a cloud-based master inventory of items and materials. So our first challenge was, how do we digitally maintain these sub-components of the large assets? And how do we characterize them uh, into sort of materials and volumes in a digital way that a computer can understand? And thereafter, we needed some kind of an AI reasoning methodology uh, that can help to predict end of operational life, which we refer to as a circular economy plan. So this circular economy plan can be thought of as a recommendation, such as whether to push it to a marketplace, whether to donate a particular item to a charity and so on. So the idea was, can we make use of AI to help with this uh, decision ma making steps? So, um, the first task, as, as I said, would typically be that someone would go to a site and then manually, uh, well, first take the video, let's say a video stream and then manually try and annotate this. And of course, this is a very laborious task. However, once a sufficient number of label data, which is labeled video with these annotations is collected, we are then in a position to train an artificial intelligence model to try to automatically recognize these objects uh, and this would then have a significant reduction uh, on the demand on a human person sitting and going through streams of video data. Now, AI is known to do this very well. Uh, typically, we would use a deep learning algorithm such as a convolutional neural net. These are well known to be extremely effective at feature extraction for object recognition in images. And what they essentially do is following several layers, neural layers of non-linear non transformations. They, these model a particular representation that would allow the neural net to recognize objects uh, very effectively uh, from uh, images, right? So that is essentially the first task that we can do to try and reduce this manual burden. Now, once we finish that, we go to the next phase, which is object characterization. Now, this is a little, even more challenging manually, because once objects are recognized, we have to uh, identify them into their constituent parts, because it may be there are certain constituent parts within an asset that is actually usable uh, or can be repurposed um, uh, instead of the entire asset. Sometimes it could be the entire object, sometimes it could be the materials. Here, we can use existing technologies such as, let's say, barcode readers or optical character recognition readers as a, as a first step towards extracting some generic um, high-level information about the object, right? We can then also um, augment that with some maintenance logs uh, because that would then provide accurate descriptions of the condition of those items, uh, their functional use, and so on. Thereafter, all of this information can also be maintained in what we call taxonomies, which help us to relate objects and items together. And that sort of helps the AI to do its reasoning a little bit better. And for this, we use something called the European category waste code standards to try and structure the relationships of these objects, uh, which we call the taxonomy. So here's an example of a uh, taxonomy, let's say. And basically for these categories of objects, uh, we can assign a particular uh, object code um, and 
that category category code is helpful and and it can also identify objects objects that belong let's say to the same type of family and why might this be useful for us well if we know these relationships we can almost try to estimate for similar types of objects what is the estimated carbon footprint and things like that also, if we know what family they belong to based on this code, uh, we can improve searching through our inventory and matching user needs with the specifications on the inventory uh, items and so on. So once this digital characterization is complete and the object is identified, described and properties estimated, we then can, we can move to our next phase, which is actually called a system learning phase. Now, this essentially involves um, trying to ensure that any valuable experiences, valuable lessons learned are somehow digitally encoded so that an AI or a machine learning algorithm, or algorithm can make use of. So what this involves is, so once that asset, let's say, is, has been decided to be decomposed into its subcomponents and the materials are all mapped through the characterization process we saw earlier, we want to also digitally encode the other aspects, such as you know, the levels to which different materials can be reused, recycled, and disposed. Um, and this entire uh, object or, or this arti artifact here, we call this, we call this, refer to this as a case. And uh, we can think of this almost like a lessons learned. Uh, situation. And if we collect over time several of these lessons learned uh, situations into a repository, this can then be harnessed by our AI reasoning methods or our machine learning methods to support decision making. And in the prophecy project, we actually use a, a very well known uh, reasoning methodology called case based reasoning. So let's have a quick look at what that is. And this now takes us to the systems reasoning phase. Okay. So for the reasoning phase, um, this uh, case-based reasoning approach is ex known to have been applied in a variety of different applications because the methodology is sufficiently generic. It has been applied to healthcare decision support, aerospace, um, uh, and all detection of satellites, uh, legal reasoning systems, and so on. And the, the reason why it is so generic is because it is based on this single assumption where um, similar problems from the past may have solutions that can be reused with re recurring similar problems in the future. So if we have a way of capturing digitally the, the problem and the solution that worked for us in the past in a repository, we then have the opportunity to make use of all those experiences and lessons learned. And essentially, it can work with a whole bunch of different types of data, sensor stream data, time series, logs, records, textual data. And it can, the, the solution component can be just a basic classification, or it could be a design. It has been applied, to, for example, in architectural design. It could be a plan uh, and, and so on. So to summarize case-based reasoning, essentially it, it is a way of capturing past experiences. It is known to help with uh, decision-making and maintaining consistency in, in the decisions we make. And most importantly, in a knowledge management sort of situation, it allows us to share best practice. So now how do we actually apply this within the prophecy project? Once we have the CBR system in place, uh, what we then, think is let's assume we, we have a new problem, right? So given a new asset for decomm decommissioning, we gather all the asset related data. Uh, we then go through that process of extracting the information, ca digitally characterizing it. Uh, and this particular part forms the query into the CBR system. Um, and this query, if you see it, it will have some features are known, and there, there'll be many features that are not known, like details of the materials or uh, values estimated. We don't know those. Uh, we also don't know the circular plan. So the idea is we put in the query with the things we know, and we are hoping the CBR system can make use of its past knowledge to try and fill, fill in these gaps. 
okay? So the first stage of this CBR is to try and retrieve this similar um, past experience. So these are similar aged asset decom life cycle cases um, that it is going to retrieve. Here, because we talk of this notion of similarity, it is important that we are able to implement in our system uh, what is similarity. And that means how do you compare textual data? How do you compare video, integers, and so on? And, and that correct uh, description of the similarity is important to ensure that this phase is effective. After, we, after the retrieval, we move to this next reuse phase. Here, what happens is the, all the materials and the value estimates from the retrieved similar cases can be used in some way to identify what might be likely details of materials and how can we propose estimates for this new query problem that we had there. Um, but usually we cannot just reuse everything from scratch. There will be some, some components that we do need to revise. So we have this revision stage. And this stage, uh, what it does is takes the proposed estimate values and it tries to fit it better to the new query. And this usually involves a human in the loop. And essentially what we have to do is look at what are the differences in the, this situation versus the past situations and uh, ensure we um, change or uh, revise uh, the solution accordingly. So this adapted solution then is actually the new uh, plan or solution for our query. And um, finally, in the retain stage, the, this newly formed full case can be added to the repository of existing cases. And this sort of improves the system's reasoning for future uh, problems. So that is essentially the CBR uh, approach. It is extremely generic and we have a built uh, architecture called Clued CBR at our GU and I will pass you on to my colleague Ike who will do a demo using the prophecy use case. Well, thanks Emily. Um, so these are a uh, dashboard of the Clued CBR framework which is our in-house CBR system. It runs on cloud infrastructure and uses microservices architecture. It's the system supports from small applications to very large applications and can run multiple projects concurrently, as you can see uh, in the dashboard, um, the list of existing projects in this instance. So this demo is to uh, show an aspect of CBR application uh, to the prophecy project as discussed by uh, Nemuli. Uh, for the demo, the list here represents the items um, that will be on, on assets. So you have the um, asset items and the description of those items using um, attribute values, such as the name of the item, uh, textual description, um, it's a category that maps it to a taxonomy. We we'll have a status information that shows whether it's in use or not in use. The condition, which could be new, refurbished, not working, and so on. And we could present a, a wide range of attributes, um, some of which we may know or not know, as Nimali mentioned. So when it comes to decision making, uh, um, on the item, we can click into that. And this shows an example of a refurbished uh, television. Here we have the attributes in more detail that shows the ones we've seen before. We also have things like the brand name of the item, the model, have features which could represent could be represented with a more complex data type to show a wide range of features. So for a TV, we might also want to see what color it is and so on. We'll have the material information and um, data, data of purchase, the price. We also have um, links to external taxonomies, uh, design international code, and these are the waste code. 
So as Neverly discussed, so one of the key aspects is to try to automate the disinformation acquisition aspect to make it as uh, less demanding as possible so that we can quickly get a characterization of the item. We could also have um, a service of maintenance log for the item, um, which shows the uh, history of services or maintenance works that will also give an idea of its condition. On the right is the information that has been generated by comparing the characteristics of this object to uh, this item to previous similar items in the case space. So it uses these attributes. And one of the key aspects of CDR is determining how or uh, on data is in trying to determine what makes two items similar. So you have a range of attributes, and for each of these, we'll have to specify what similarity knowledge is required for the comparison and how important is that uh, attribute in actually determining similarity. So this information regarding the reuse, uh, recycle, or disposal of the item will be uh, different depending on what items are similar to that particular item. So if we go to a different item that is, um, in this case, a used laptop, you can see it's making a slightly different recommendation. And on the third system that there are, uh, that could help in decision making in deciding whether to send an item to say recycling center or to list it on a, a marketplace for, for reuse. So in this case, the recycling might be preferred. And if you're looking at the item attributes, it's, it's not working. Um, and the service history, we show that it's probably out of warranty and, and not in a very good condition. You could also go further to see the items that were deemed to be most similar to these uh, from the case base, which could provide further information that will be uh, required to make a decision on this. So uh, I mentioned the similarity knowledge for determining how what makes them similar. And some of that information will come from this, which is the weight of the item weight of the, um, or importance of the item in, uh, of the attribute in determining similarity. So in this case, I have a relative weight of five to the name compared to say the status. Depending on the use case, you might want location, for instance, to have a higher weight. And so the weight and the similarity functions, which are configured will help in determining that. So for the similarity function, uh, I'll switch over to the configuration that shows those attributes that you've seen and, and what similarity metric that we use for retrieval on that. So depending on the data type of the attributes, we uh, determine what similarity knowledge or function metric is most relevant for that. So we'll have the string types and we'll have a range of methods for that. For say a date attribute, we can look at the closest data as a similarity and this is a numeric type for the numeric type for price. So uh, this part of the system configuration, which uh, helps in, in designing that and the system is quite flexible so that you can select from a whole range of similarity metrics. So um, that's on the, um, that's it on the um, prophecy uh, demonstration, but the system can be applied to a wide range of applications as uh, Nemali mentioned in her, in her on the talk. Um, one of the example is, uh, current project with uh, Nudge Exchange on skills matching, where we try to map um, roles to capabilities. 
and the specific application is in um, trying to help individuals or experts who want to transition from uh, fossil energy industry to renewable energy to find suitable um, equivalent rules. Um, so uh, that's a quick demonstration of the CLUT uh, CBR system. And I will now hand over to my colleague Carlos to talk about the work on corrosion detection. Thank you very much, Ike. Uh, as you can see, one of the key uh, goals or milestones in order to achieve net zero is the correct handling of assets in the industry. Now, one of the assets that some engineers and people in the industrial practice uh, side that they have to, let's say, handle are engineering drawings. Right, so there is a collection of engineering drawings that represent maybe the composition of the facilities, such as oil rigs or chemical plants. And in this project, which was done in collaboration with Archimec LTD and funded by Innovate UK, we will present a simple demo of how you can detect corrosion sections in engineering drawings based on machine learning. Now, uh, inspection engineering is a highly important field in the oil and gas sector for analyzing the health of offshore assets. These uh, assets will uh, get um, corrosion, which is a natural occurring phenomenon, which arises as a result of a chemical reaction between a metal and its environment, causing it to degrade over time and costing the global economy around $2.5 trillion per annum. So the destructive nature of corrosion is quite evident in facilities. And following the downturn endured by the industry in recent times, we need to combat corrosion as, uh, as much as we can or as in as many ways as we can, okay? Because if not, uh, this can be destructive for the companies, it can be destructive for the economy, and it's also not friendly for our net zero goals, right? Although we have carried efforts to detect corrosion in the facilities, so for example, getting the feed from the ROVs uh, trying to do automated recognition of the image. There are other ways in which we can also aim at um, detecting corrosion before it even happens. And this can be done by trying to identify corrosion sections within the drawing so that we can know where it is that we have to act timely. Now, as I said before, engineering drawings, such as piping and instrumentation drawings or PNIDs, are some of the widely, most widely used assets for this purpose. Unfortunately, the existence of legacy data, for example, drawings that, have, uh, that were done from facilities that are 30 or 40 years old, or uh, poor practices such as losing the files or storing them on CDs that have been lost or scratched, have led to a significant number of PNIDs which need to be printed and checked by risk analysts manually instead of being just checked digitally. So there is still a need to digitize these drawings to have them in a virtual environment where we can detect these corrosion sections. Now, in this project, what we do uh, was using computer vision and methods such as the one cited by uh, Professor Nirmali, uh, like C, uh, convolutional neural networks and other type of uh, machine learning models that can detect the important information within the printed drawings once they have been scanned or once that we have uh, turned the PDF, for example, in which they are stored into an image. And then once that we detect the main uh, indicators, so for example, text, or some symbols that indicate some uh, particular properties, we can build a knowledge graph which represents interconnected components. And that way the user can mark up these sections digitally. So for example, we look for codes that uh, indicate which are the name of the connectors or the properties of the connectors. We look also for these uh, figures that are called corrosion connectors. And as you can see here, two different models were trained identify these uh, text and these symbols. 
We will be presenting this work shortly in a conference uh, which will be held in Switzerland, but here is the demo that we will also be presenting there. So the demo is uh, currently owned by Archimec and they have allowed us to show how the, their demo works. So in this case, the user specifies a number of uh, files. Let's say this row one, there's a file in the computer and the system has automatically found some codes that are associated such as HA1 or CC1. Then the user uh, indicates a color and indicates which is the one that uh, wants to see highlighted. So for example, HA1, and immediately the system highlights to the user within the drawing, which are the codes, which is the text that has that uh, code. So the user can now mark up the corrosion sections if necessary. This process can continue until the, um, the user wishes to. And, and they can find different codes, they can specify their own codes, so maybe a different collection of drawings, instead of saying HA, maybe it says AB, or that's the way in which these codes are indicated. So the process can continue like this, and then the user can and uh, highlight the entire drawing. So I'm going to just skip to the end of this drawing, because of course, this is just a markup, and in the end, uh, the drawing has been marked up. So in summary, this practice can help in a lot of ways, not only helping inspection engineers detect the corrosion sections timely, but also reduce uh, printing in the industry. So instead of having to print all of these drawings and have to mark them manually, we have a way in which we avoid this. And in contrary, we pass the printed drawings to a paperless environment. So connecting uh, this idea, now I want to uh, give uh, Chamat the opportunity to speak about another project that we have where paper costs are reduced. Thank you. Thanks, Carlos. Um, so yeah, so I'm going to talk about Attender. So when we talk about the net zero, net zero journey, I think going paperless would be like a number one thing we all get into the minds. Uh, so, uh, Attender is an in-house uh, solution which we have built uh, in, from the School of Computing to digitize attendance management. So, it's basically recording and then processing of uh, attendance information. Um, so, what we have identified is, we have identified four main points of, uh, like pain points where we can improve and digitize this process. So, the first one is uh, the unverifiedness. So, when we consider a paper-based method. So usually most places still use like paper-based uh, signing sheets to uh, mark attendance. So it's highly unverified and then uh, it's inefficient. So the inefficiency comes from different places. So for example, if it's a printed method, someone needs to go there and print and then sort of uh, then data enter them back in the back office. So there's a huge process behind the scenes, even if you don't see just signing a sheet, uh, sheet of paper. Uh, so then the next one is it's a highly inconvenient, inconvenient process for students where they just have to like wait for the sheet of paper to come around and then uh, mark and then pass it on. So it's a very high, highly uh, inconvenient uh, course during a lecture session. And the next main pain, pain point we have identified is uh, the inconsistency. So it, that mainly comes from like large organizations. So for example, for a university, there are like let's say 10 different schools and every school might have a slightly different process, not the common, like one common uh, process to do attendance monitoring. So attendance is not only specific for university level, uh, uh, like uh, it's not a university task, so it can be applied to many other places. Like for example, if it's a uh, EU level meeting, you, you can like digitize that part. So if it's a corporate meetings, sort of like uh, events and things like that. So we can use this attendance management in many different places. Uh, and one of the other inspirations is, uh, so I think most of you have seen this uh, in the email footer. So please consider the environment before printing this email. So what this really means is, uh, so be digital. So if you are presenting, presenting a digital solution, that means we are going paperless and it would end up with very low carbon footprint. So our method is sort of aiming in that direction as well to uh, go full digital and then it would involve the low carbon footprint, uh, which we are considering a huge impact. Um, so what Attender does is it solves all these 
main four points which we have identified. So it could uh, have verified the student information. It would have a very efficient process. It's like real time uh, attendance monitoring. And then it would be very convenient and consistent throughout the university or the enterprise. Um, so I'll quickly show you like uh, how the solution came into place. Uh, so we have two mobile applications, which are one for the lecturer and one for the student and lecturer would send a signal and the students would pick up the signal. So it's a pretty straightforward process, but it involves sort of like background engineering and sort of uh, proper design to that. And one of the key issues we have identified like in the beginning of this project is, uh, for example, for RGU, uh, we have to depend on existing systems. So we can't come up with a brand new solution and say all the students need to register and things like that. So we had to deal with existing uh, sort of uh, solutions. So one is the authentication provider and the next is uh, timetabling management. So I think when moving towards the net zero journey, like for any corporation or enterprise, they would need to stick to these sort of existing methods and solutions they already have. And so they need to adapt on top of that, but end of the day, it's a new solution for the end user. So that's uh, what we want to like uh, have it here. Um, so we have two uh, mobile applications, as I mentioned. Uh, so I'll just quickly show you the, the screens uh, which we have for mobile, for the student side. So students would just basically log into the application and then uh, they'll first see their home screen and a huge uh, mark attendance button. So that's the only interaction we'd like to like uh, a student needs to do. So they'll click that button and that would sort of uh, find the signal uh, and then mark up with the uh, matching uh, class, which they are supposed to be in. And uh, sort of we did the offline method uh, as well because uh, we had to support offline marking uh, for like edge cases, like uh, a large number of uh, students being in one place might uh, cause like a router timeout or things like that. So, uh, so we have supported the offline method as well. And in the middle, you can see the timetable for a student. So it's like a daily timetable. Um, and uh, the next part is the lecturer side of it. So lecturers has the login as same as the student, and then uh, they'll also have their timetable and the lecturers would decide which time they are going to start marking. So they can decide, okay, I'm going to start marking the middle of the class or end of the class. They can decide and start the marking process whenever they want. So once the lecturer marking process is started, only the students can do the marking, like mark themselves. Um, so during this COVID times, we, we faced a major issue where like we, we fully had the version uh, support in like, uh, like end of 2019 and uh, like mid 2020, like to support fully uh, like offline, like, like on campus classes, but we quickly switched to uh, uh, remote marking with, uh, with a new feature called uh, like basically remote marking attendance. So as soon as uh, the lecturer starts then in a Zoom session or like any online method, they can just, uh, do the marking process as a normal uh, as they are in the class and uh, yeah so we got a lot of good feedback uh, going forward uh, and so we did our first pilot back in uh, 2019 and then uh, sort of uh, continued doing our second pilot uh, as well so now currently we are in our second pilot stage but we are running fully on uh, for fully inside the, the school of computing and also business school uh, we are sort of trying to get more and more classes in all and we are trying to adapt like go forward and move into other schools as well. Um, so a few statistics I'd like to share here. So we, during the past semester, we collected uh, 28,000 attendance records and that's from over like thousand students and over 500 sessions. So just imagine how much of paper that would be for 500 different classes. Uh, and sort of, if we consider the whole university, it would, it's a huge amount in that case and, but imagine it's happening in a day-to-day -day basis in, in enterprise level. Uh, so big corporations still might have this uh, paper signing uh, sheets uh, and different like manual processes. Uh, so on the right side, I have some like stats uh, taken from uh, Kaiswara, which is a, a print manufacturing company. So they have mentioned clearly here, like uh, the impact of uh, having this uh, A4 sheets, like uh, we are sort of free, like wasting that sort of, uh, uh, resources and it's a huge number of like carbon uh, footprint uh, we are going to uh, uh, have if you are having a manual process and so we expect our green savings to be very large because of the multiple factors we are considering here so one is the paper obviously and then the ink 
So, and then there's this power consumption, which we think we have reduced in a large scale, because for example, as soon as you get a paper of sheet, uh, sorry, sheet of uh, paper with markings, we need to manually data enter. So it takes some hours of uh, admin staff. So we have a huge cost saving as well as a green saving adapted with this very, I'd say very like a straightforward digitization me me mechanism. So we are sort of uh, hoping to expand our solution into other areas. Like for example, we can say, uh, care homes still have like manual marking things like that so we are looking forward to expand our solution into those those market and uh, basically go through a certain net zero journey as well for my way so thank you all for listening uh, i'd hand back over to uh, uh, neil to continue the session great thanks so much tamath and um, maybe if you could stop sharing your screen sorry that'd be great Brilliant. Thank you so much for for really insightful and interesting talks on the topic of digitalization and the, the benefits that it could bring. If I could just take this chance to remind everyone, if you do have any questions, please do pop them into the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. Um, I'll maybe kick off with, with just a couple while people um, get a chance to pop their questions in there. Maybe I could start off with, with normally. So what I was really interested in was is asking the, the case-based reasoning and the digital te techniques used. Um, I saw that it was for uh, within the energy industry and used, there was a few office equipment and, and television sets used. How adaptable are those digital techniques used to different sectors? Sorry, normally you're on mute. I think that's mostly the most common statement since COVID. <laughs> I know, I'm sorry about that. Okay, so I think the most um, obvious ones are anything to do with decision, de de decision support. So, for example, if you take the health, health sector, you can have a diagnosis at, as one of the uh, decision support uh, places. Another one is to, you know, recommend treatments. Um, and with all of these, all, so if you take the thing about treatment recommendation, what we can do is for, let's say, if it's a um, cancer treatment or self-management of some kind of chronic uh, uh, disease, what we need is a collection of electronic patient records and attached to those electronic patient records, what were the treatments or diagnosis that went with those records? Because then what happens is when we encounter new patients, we can go dip into our repository, retrieve similar patients, and then say, okay, in those situations, these types of treatments, this type of diagnosis uh, was what was observed. So not only does it allow us to do um, straightforward decision support, but it allows you to personalize it because we are looking at this thing of similar people, similar situations. So that's in healthcare. Uh, we once, or actually, when we first started CBR research at RGO, this was in 1996 or 97. Interestingly, it was with AstraZeneca. And at that point, what we did was we, we were using CBR to help tablet formulation. So at, at that point, they, they used to have um, a, a collection of rules. So when a new drug comes into um, uh, uh, comes into the market, you apparently you need to have a whole bunch of uh, other ingredients that goes into the drug to make it a viable tablet that you can swallow uh, without difficulty that, so that it dissolves in the right place and it doesn't have bad chemical reactions when it gets to the tummy. And all that uh, is managed by the right ingredients and the right ingredients depends on the chemical and physical properties of the drug. And so uh, it, it seems to be that uh, the, the Pharmace, pharmaceutical experts, they used to basically identify uh, when, they, when they got a drug, they would think, what is a similar drug? What ingredients did we use? And they tried to create a recipe. So that fitted really well into CBR. So that's only two examples, but, but that's huge. It's a huge number. I could go on and on, but I won't. <laughs> I really appreciate that. And I think obviously, as mentioned, you know, it, it's personalized and takes different experiences into account. So maybe yourself or Ike could, could, could answer this one. Um, how long would it take for it to build up this knowledge and experiences to really start contributing to a company's circular plan? I could, do you want to start off? Yeah, so um, if a system that, um, that is built for this, it will take, it depends on 
on how much the the user of the system feel is enough to start to make recommendations with. But the good aspect, the good part is that the this information is expected to improve as time goes on. So at, at the start, you could have like a handful of cases. The the, the and like in the example that we demonstrated using um taxonomies where we have um semantic knowledge um if you have for instance uh, say a laptop and then another in your case base you have um okay let me say a tv and then in your case base you have a monitor so it could determine that there is some kind of similarity between those two. And so even if you don't have the exact example in your case base, it could use um, or similar um, items to do that. But as time goes on and you get uh, feedback or make decisions on items or um, from users, depending on the use case, it builds up the knowledge that's in the case base and that will help to improve the kind of recommendations that it's able to make. Um, so, um, yeah. if you have anything to add to that uh... yeah uh, just to say that it very much depends on the domain so some domains do come up with the corporate memories as they call and a lot of this corporate um, data can be um, converted converted into cases in that can go into the case base but there could be other domains for example the one which we did with prophecy um the, the the cases were not already easily available and so there is a initial knowledge engineering phase where we have to spend time trying to collect that cases those cases and only thereafter will you can will you be able to get something useful but that is true with most machine learning AI algorithms, because if you don't have the data collected, curated, transformed, pre-processed, uh, we cannot get meaningful things out of the models. That makes sense. So we've got a few questions in the, in the Q&A box, so I'll just jump straight into them. And I think the first one's probably related to Chamath with the uh, attender um, uh, digital application. So I think it's more along the lines of balancing, you know, um, the positive effects of these digitalization uh, techniques with other things. So for example, do you have details on the power consumption from the student charging the phone? It's a step in the, di the right direction, obviously, but I think, you know, is, is this a balance or is it an end solution? Yeah, so I think that that's a, like a very valid question. Like we, we always figure like how to think where we are reducing this carbon footprint. Anyways, it's trying to go in some direction, but uh, for us, what we have seen is paper-based like this, uh, like paper-based, like going paperless is a huge uh, improvement rather than just, let's say the, the, the cost of uh, power we are taking from a, like a mobile phone battery. So that might be very less compared to like stack of A4 bundles in a, in a university level. So, so that, that, that's sort of a balance. So I'd say, uh, but from a, from a company or, or university perspective, we are trying to reduce the wastage from the university side as well, like, for example, uh, the amount of hours spent on typing, data entry, then printing, so that, that sort of thing. So if we consider the, the ink cartridge, that's a huge uh, savings we are going to add up. Uh, yeah. You mentioned as well that so you were in the second pilot stage and you were looking at further expansion and optimization uh, yeah. of, of application. What do you see the end, sort of the end use of, of, of this being, sort of the, the overall opportunities linked with it? So overall, I think at then we are trying to make a more generalized version of the product. So for example, now we can quickly adapt to another organization and adapt their existing, let's say, authentication, event management systems easily and sort of use the same system. So we want to build our own general sys solution where everyone can just get on board there. So yeah, that would be our end sort of journey. <laughs> so another question in the Q&A box is just maybe a general question to, to everyone. So what work have we done uh, respect to measuring emissions in the oil and gas sector operations? I think uh, not just from the school side, we've obviously got other um, academic schools who, who've been involved in this. Does anyone have any experience of that? No, I, th I think that may be more, more along the lines of some of our other academic, uh, uh, other academic schools. Um, so one of the big things that affects these kind of systems are stress and strain, um, according to one uh, chat in the box. If you cannot evaluate the effects of this or the degree of stress, it will introduce error into the system. Is that 
something that you all would agree with or is there anything to add? So, um, Neil, maybe I will also, uh, so Marcus Travers has two questions. I, I, I can, well, there's one about patients and then maybe I'll try and go to the stress and strain. So okay. I think um, he, um, Marcus says, how can you be sure that you have all the relevant information so that the outcome matches to other similar examples? I think it's a very valid question because a lot of it is involved in you know, how to ensure that what you're retrieving is relevant to the current situation. And this very much depends on the, those, let's say, designing or engineering the features that and then how to engineer the similarity measures that Ike was presenting, saying if it's a uh, text, this is how you measure similarity. If it's numbers, this is what. So we have to pay some attention to how to do that correctly. We also have to involve the domain expert because they might say, well, out of these 50 features, only 10 are really important to identify the name neighbors or the patients. So these are things we can't just do in ad hoc manner. We have to work with the with the domain expert. Another, another technique that we make use of during this process is explainable AI. So because we are looking at similar patients, we can also show different patients. You can say, okay, the, here's, a, here's a patient who looks very similar, but are, is different in these ways. So by showing comparing and contrasting similar things in your nearby space, again, it helps the domain expert or the engineer of the system to fine tune all these parameters to get it to work uh, the way it wants. So it's not just a magical thing that just happens by itself. You have to put some work to get the right knowledge in there to make it um, deployable in, 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 the, in the wild, if you like. This next question, one of the big things that affects these systems are stress and strain. I, I, I'm a little bit unsure what is meant by stress and strain. It, if you cannot evaluate the effect of this or the degree of stress, it will introduce error into the system. So I'm not sure what, what is meant by st stress, but more generically, uh, with most AI and machine learning um, uh, methods, uh, we do go through an evaluation methodology, which sort of tests for accuracy for performance and within accuracy, there's various different metrics. Um, perhaps, I don't know if one of my colleagues has an idea what is meant, my, what could be meant by stress and strain. Maybe we could ask um, Marcus to uh, if if we would be uh, keen to follow up on that. Maybe to to pop something in the box there and um, to give a little bit of clarification. Um, and and just while that's happening, I'd be quite keen to to bring in Carlos. Um, I thought one one thing that was really interesting about Carlos's presentation was themes for COP twenty six uh, is the climate co benefits. So the other benefits that sort of the decarbonisation processes can bring. And I was just wondering if alongside the digitization and the going paperless, the corrosion detection software had, you know, does he have any indication on the, the measuring of the time and cost efficiencies that it brought? I think that would be a follow up from the same project because this is, let's say, just the first step. Uh, oil, and, oil and gas companies have a lot of departments and all of them understand assets differently. Sometimes the same drawing is being shown to two different engineers and they see it differently. It's like they, their eyes focus on different things. It's quite funny how you see a risk analyst looking at some things, but an electricist looking at others. So you have to, let's say, once that you have understood how one uh, technician uses the drawing, then take it to the next person so that they can use that information, as you say, to calculate times or maybe to create a dashboard where this information can be used intelligently. So of course, that's only the first step, but then you have to take it forward. And I just wanted to take the chance now that I have a um, microphone open to, let's say, maybe share some intuitions about uh, Nelson's question of the reducing emission in the oil and gas sector. I can think of two, let's say, related examples, but both of them complementary because one would be on reducing emissions as a whole, and the other would be working with the oil and gas sector operations. So the first one of reducing emissions is that uh, we have been trying to work uh, with the Mexican government to, uh, let's say, do a system where we can model uh, the transportation system in Mexico City and try to see when and where our emissions can be reduced based on the traffic. 
and based on the demand of the of the population. So to try to model uh, transport and see where are the peak times and it's it's a practice that in Mexico doesn't exist at all. But obviously through some uh, computational techniques and through acquiring the proper data, we could try to let's say shorten some routes or do some different things. And the other project is also about trying to work with our refineries and oil and gas facilities in Mexico again to try to reduce uh, costs emissions by treating um, uh, well petrol in, in different ways, let's say. So I can think about those examples, but yeah, indeed it's very interesting to see that all the projects that we have shown can be further developed to, to let's say, to do better things. <laughs> That's great, I really appreciate it. Um... Your, your input to that, that question there, Carlos, that, that was really helpful. Um, and just before we finish up, I'd be quite keen to ask just to, to, the, to the whole open forum, um, what sectors do you think, you know, we've talked about energy today a, a wee bit and other, other sectors, where do you see the main opportunities for digitalization that can support net zero you know, specific sectors? I think almost all the sectors can be <laughs> moving towards that direction so yeah yeah I, I think yeah education sector also has a lot of places where we can sort of uh, go towards uh, net zero journey so because, because we are always dealing with like paper-based mechanisms so, yeah, at, at the current stage but we might need to keep some but we'll have to go off and do some hybrid methods uh. I think possibly also even the finance sector like the, the IT is becoming a big area for that uh, particularly AI, but also we, we as, as I mentioned, uh, the legal um, domain, um, because they have lots and lots of uh, data, whether that is in paper form or not, um, that, that can help to be digitized into a supporting legal reasoning. So in fact, I think there's a current project uh, that uh, maybe IQ want to say something about it. Uh, yeah, so that's a project with uh, legal PTR, where they are looking at uh, digitization and also being able to provide um, assist, uh, help um, legal, uh, say, lawyers and other legal experts to get the information they need, especially for lawyers taking cases to court. So, um, the, of course, digitization will be a first step to be able to do that and being able to digitize all the information they need to of course, reduce the uh, dependence on paper. Uh, and well, just to finish on that part, uh, for me, in, in my particular case, uh, my journey, let's say, has taken me uh, to the construction and the healthcare sector. So these are the two sectors that I've also seen that want to uh, go net zero and practices like digitizing manual records and trying to automate certain aspects within the pipeline, I think are the ones that uh, I, I have seen the most vital right now in this journey. Great, that, that's all really interesting. I think we certainly agree with uh, Chamath's, Chamath's feeling that almost all sectors would have that uh, digitization opportunities uh, apparent there and um, based on uh, everyone's responses. And um, normally, I'm sorry, just, just to quickly say that there was the, the response from Marcus there to the questions though. So what often what happens is that stress introduces a change so essentially, if what you know, if these digitization projects um, cause changes, then you know maybe the systems will react differently in the end. Is that something that that you found? So he, he has given an example. If you if you stress a metal, its elastic properties are altered. If you, if you stress a person, they no longer have, behave as they might normally do. Okay, okay. If you say, uh huh, right. So so I think it's about um, not not only just going and adding AI and various machine learning, it's also ensuring that the, um, what, so what we actually do is it, when, it, when it involves people, we involve those people from the beginning. So we have things like co-creation activities where we work with people, they, they are co-designing the solution and where possible co-creating it so that when you deploy it, it doesn't uh, have unexpected consequences, whether that is cultural, you know, because it, it changes your behavior 
the culture you work in. Um, it can have other types of economical impact that we haven't foreseen. So we, all we can do is to try and mitigate that, is to try and involve as many people during the, the design phase. Uh, other than that, I guess we cannot know some things, you know, uh, uh, until they happen. So I guess we have to be flexible. I think it would be fair to say that system integration within these companies that we work with is really important to yeah. ensuring that the programs are as effective as they possibly can be. Yeah. Great. Well, on that note, I'd just like to take this opportunity to thank everyone, um, you know, both the speakers again for these brilliant presentations and everyone who attended and the engagement and the questions. Really, really interesting and topical topic. And uh, yeah, thanks everyone again. We will be putting the recording of this webinar up onto the website in the next week or so. So please do look out for that. If you have any questions or anything else that you'd like to add, please do reach us out, out to us directly. We'd be delighted to, to continue this conversation. And nothing else to add. Thank you so much for, for joining again and enjoy the rest of your day.